Welcome to Machine Minds, where technology and humanity meet. I'm your host, Greg Tarusian, founder of Samson Rose, a recruiting and search business focused on the robotics and AI industries. The Machine Minds show is where we dive deep into the intricate world of robotics and artificial intelligence. As a staffing industry leader with a passion for the frontiers of technology, I'm pleased to be bringing you intimate conversations with the founders, investors, and trailblazers who are at the heart of the AI and robotics revolution. In each episode, we dig into their journeys, the applications of the products they're working on, and the breakthroughs that are shaping our future. Join us as we explore how these machine minds are transforming the way we live, work, and understand our world. Whether you're an entrepreneur, a tech enthusiast, or just curious about this amazing field, you'll learn something new with each episode. Let's delve into the extraordinary. Let's delve into machine minds. Hello and welcome to Machine Minds. I'm your host, Greg Tarusian, founder of Samson Rose, your robotics talent search partner. And on today's episode, we've got something really interesting. I'm joined by Ali Ahmed, co-founder and CEO of Robomart. Thanks for being on the show today, Ali. Hi, Greg. Great to be here. Appreciate you taking the time. Uh, let's jump into it. Lots to discuss. Lots of interesting stuff we are going to get onto uh, shortly. But first, I always like to start with the background of uh, the guest. So before founding Robomart, you had quite an impressive international career. Can you tell us a bit about that journey and some of the pivotal moments that led you to the, the current point that you're at? Absolutely, yeah. So I started my career at GSK, uh, the pharmaceutical giant, after finishing my MBA in 2006. And then I worked at Unilever for a while before becoming a management consultant uh, in the Gulf. Um, and then in 2009, I uh, moved to, I went to, to the UK. Uh, I attended Lancaster University where I got a second master's degree. And then after graduating, I started a PhD program. It's called the High Wire Program at Lancaster. It's a cross-disciplinary program that spans computing, design, and management. Um, but after a week, I deferred it. Uh, I was really itching to get into tech and you know, start my own companies. Um, and so uh, after leaving Lancaster, I, I went to London. And I joined Groupon. And this was right after it was acquired by Groupon. It was called My City Deal in the UK. And I saw the company go from about 20 people to 300 literally overnight. And, you know, at that time, it was on the cover of Forbes as the fastest growing startup in history. Um, hasn't done incredibly well after the IPO, but at the time I was there, it was an amazing learning opportunity. And it really gave me the confidence and kind of motivation to start my first startup. Um, and so, you know, I, I started my first company, Lootbox, in 2011. It was focused around video messaging technology. And then in, uh, in a few years later, I started Dispatch, which was at the time the fastest growing on-demand delivery service in the UK. Um, and then, you know, after the UK, I moved to the US in 2017. And in early 2018, my co-founders and I launched Robomart. And over the last, what, six, six and a half years now, uh, I've been fortunate, you know, through building this robotics company, uh, to have also mentored at Singularity University, Founders Institute. Uh, I've done a few angel investments in the robotics space, and I serve as a robotics and hardware expert to WeFunder. We awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Great recap. Thank you. And what drew you to be an entrepreneur? Like, well, what made you want to make that switch from working at like big companies like GSK and stuff and then having that taste of the startup world at Groupon? Well, I mean, during my college days, I actually wanted to be an entrepreneur. It was this fascination that I had, you know, when I was, I think, 19. Um, and I'd set goals for myself that, you know, by this age, I will start my first company. By this age, make my first million, you know, like a lot of kids do. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I also kind of really felt like um, I wanted to do something beyond just be a cog in a massive multinational company, right? Um, not to say there's anything wrong with working at multinationals, but it just wasn't for me, right? I, I really felt like I want to make an impact in this world. And to do that, you know, one of the clearest way to do so is through entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah, well said. For those, uh, let, let's switch gears and just talk about uh, Robomart in a little bit more detail. So for, for the listeners, can you share what exactly Robomart does and your technology, how it works? Absolutely, yeah. So we build self-driving stores for retailers. <laughs> Uh, a few years ago, we built the world's first self-driving store, debuted at CES. Um, Robomarts essentially give retailers the ability to scale their footprint 
at a fraction of the cost of brick and mortar uh, while being faster, cheaper, more convenient than delivery and much more profitable. Uh, and so we allow retailers to deploy their own shops. Uh, they're full checkout free. We call it auto checkout. So consumers can hail RoboMarts just like they would hail an Uber or a Lyft. They don't have to create a basket beforehand. They don't have to order anything. They're just tapping one button and the RoboMart shows up in under 10 minutes uh, and they get to shop at their doorstep for grocery items, wow. ice cream, and snacks. That is very cool. So where, where are they deployed right now? So we did our first few pilots in West Hollywood in LA, mm -hmm. and we've just opened up our East Coast headquarters in Baltimore to launch with our first major customer, Mars. So they're launching the Snickers Ice Cream Road Marts. Uh, we actually on Sunday had our media launch um, here in Baltimore. I'm so jealous. That is my favorite ice cream. And I like no exaggeration, I'd eat three or four without even breathing. So <laughs> it's a good thing I wasn't there. <laughs> uh, so where did that idea come from? Yeah, so my co-founder, Imad, um, he and I used to work together at Unilever way back, I think 14, 15 years ago now. And he was in ice cream, right? I was, I was in food and beverages and he was in ice cream. And he wanted to recreate, he had the idea back then. He wanted to recreate the ice cream van, but have it be for everything in retail and have it be on demand. And this predates on-demand delivery services. This predates smartphones, app stores. And so the idea was to pick up one of those rotary dial phones and say, send the store to me and get a grocery store right outside your house so you can pick your fruit, vegetables, you know, all your, all your essentials uh, in the most convenient way possible. You know, and um, it was still just an idea back then. It was way ahead of its time. So we kind of parked it. But I mentioned my experience at Dispatch in the UK. So it was in the on-demand delivery space. And you know, we had thousands of dispatchers in our network. And I had started looking at automation, right? How do we make this process more profitable for retailers, less costly for, for uh, consumers. I mean, on-demand delivery, especially in the grocery field, is really a terrible experience. It's expensive. You know, sometimes you pay 100% of, of your basket order just in fees. Um, it's time-consuming and cumbersome, especially if you have to create an order on a phone. It can take 20, 30 minutes just to put an order together and then wait for somebody to go pick up your items they're never going to pick the right items. They're going to get you, you know, potentially expired items or close to expiry items. Um, and the worst part is for ice cream, it's going to be melted. You're going to get it at your doorstep. You don't know how many times we've heard from consumers that the ice cream was left at their doorstep and nobody rang the bell. Hey, I am a consumer of someone that uses Instacart multiple times a week. And the amount of returns I have to do for like rotten fruit and vegetables, damaged, like, smushed cucumbers, raspberries that are black, or it's like, I don't know, or, or avocados that are harder than a rock. <laughs> I just don't understand how some people pick those things. And then, yeah, I've had the same thing with ice cream. Like instead of notifying you that it's there, they just leave it. I'm in Southern California, so it's hot, right? So you leave that at the front door, it's done quickly. Problem is over, absolutely. Yeah. It's a terrible experience. And especially for retailers, yeah. they lose money on every single amount of order. I mean, it's it's... It's incredible that they still do it, um, and it's such a money-losing and, and unprofitable business for them. And so what we realized is that by rethinking delivery completely and creating a store that can be hailed on demand, uh, you know, these mini stores that grocery supermarkets and retailers can put out um, that can get to consumer in minutes, just like an Uber gets to people in minutes, you're never really waiting more than maybe six, seven minutes for an Uber. That's the exact same business model. It is closer to ride hailing services. That's why we call it store hailing than it is to delivery. It's, it's very smart. I just think in, in like the area that I live, it's obviously very residential or families and stuff like that. It would be a no brainer to be like, hey, I'm hailing the store. If anyone wants to get fruit and veg, it's outside. And it's just like easy, easy. Cause no one, everyone's trying to do more than they can these days anyway, right? You're trying to fit. That's why we have these delivery apps and all of that stuff. But something like that, you, you can't get over the hurdle of having a bad experience with a company like that, with Instacart, because I don't mean to bash Instacart by anyone, because the people's incentives aren't lined up the same way to choose the right stuff for you, and everyone has different preferences, right? Like some people like more green and hard bananas than more ripe or vice versa. So anyway... The product sounds awesome and the use case is definitely there. Um, 
so this new partnership with Mars, how's, how's that? That's obviously a big milestone. How's that kind of impacted the company or changed things for you guys? Well, I mean, they're not a traditional customer. Like if you think about who we target, we target supermarkets, retailers, ice cream companies. Um, but they are really pushing ice cream in a very big way, right? And they are willing to really deploy these stores as their own stores, just like a supermarket would. And so that was very compelling for us. And when we realized, you know, um, we, we, we're, we're the platform at the end of the day. We're a B2B platform. We build our technology for customers to, to deploy their own stores. So it doesn't really matter, you know, who they are, what their business model is, so long as they have products that they want to sell and they want to give consumers a fundamentally better experience. You know, one thing I didn't mention is that not only is, like you said, right, um, within groceries and ice cream, this is such a big problem, but when you just think about the steps involved in grocery delivery fulfillment, and I spent years, probably more than a decade now in that space, um, you have multiple steps. Consumer has to place an order. Then the order has to be picked and packed. Then that order has to be picked up. Then that order has to be delivered, right? We get rid of those first three processes altogether. So we are fundamentally always going to be three to five times faster than the fastest delivery service that exists today. Yeah, smart, smart, amazing. Okay, let's um, let's shift gears now because what we you and I really want to talk about and how you want to talk about right now is your recent treatise, Systema Robotica. It's set to make waves in the robotics community from what you've shared with me. I'm excited for it to come out. I'm excited for you to share the link with me. Please don't forget. <laughs> what inspired you to write it? So, yeah. So Systema Robotica is my treatise on the order and evolution of robot kind. It basically serves as humanity's guide for a future of, of, uh, non-human superintelligences and you know it's becoming more and more prevalent and more and more critical that we start thinking about how can we classify robots you know naming is such an important thing but you know you ask somebody to define a robot or to name you know uh different classes of robots and you know, it's just it's just it's unwieldy right now and even even just defining a robot you'll get 10 different definitions from 10 different people a science fiction author will define it differently. A roboticist define it differently. A person, you know, member of the public will define it differently. And so um, at its core, Systema Robotica aims to, number one, uh, make a definition of what is a robot and then compare it to other things like machines, like humans, like artificial intelligence software, and like uh, cyborgs. And then it goes into, in the second section, it goes into creating a taxonomy of robots. And virtually all taxonomies to date have been um, have been focused around functionality of the robot. So they classified like you know uh, air you know, flying robots or uh, uh, agricultural robots. Or and to me that's a fundamentally incorrect approach because functionality will lead to extreme overlap. You know if you were talking about humanoids, androids, right? So an android built for uh, a kitchen, a domestic android for a kitchen would just as easily be able to work in a factory. And so the way I've defined my taxonomy is by something I call design form. It considers a robot's design, its form, its countenance, appearance, things like its height and size, and its branding. And when you take all, the, all those elements together, you can start creating a taxonomy um, that covers all robots past, present, and future. Amazing. Amazing. What... what compelled you to write this i mean obviously it's a big thing in the industry it's a big uh i don't want to say problem but it's like we've i've heard this and we've we've talked about it previously right how do you define what a humanoid is like if it does it have tab legs does it have wheels if it has wheels does it if it doesn't have a head is it still a humanoid or some people have the you know it's a robot until it doesn't until it works and then it's a device right <laughs> all these different concepts and I'm sure you cover all of it in there, but what drew you to do this work? So that's very interesting. It was actually a conversation I was having with, um, with a fellow roboticist and, and also my co-founders and, um, and we were arguing, uh, they were using the term humanoid, humanoid, humanoid. And I, I hate that term. Um, you know, I prefer Android and there's a reason for that because we, I, I, I believe this was in 2018. We were in Dubai 
we were at this event. Uh, Rob Mart had flown over to Dubai, and um, and we were right next to our booth for Rob Mart was right next to Sophia the robot. If you if you've come across Sophia, Sophia has lifelike skin, and um, and then we call Sophia an angel. And then you look at Atlas from Boston Dynamics, and you look at Figure and all these other uh, you know androids that are metallic and they, they, they have a metallic countenance, right? We also call them humanoids. People basically call Sophia humanoid and they call figure a humanoid. But they vastly, they look vastly different. And so I was arguing, this is like years ago now, I think maybe six years, six, seven years ago. Um, I was arguing that uh, we need a better naming structure to define what a android that has human-like skin should be called and what one that is made, uh, you know, in a very metallic countenance should be called. And so the names I give them are mechanoid and synthoid. So synthoid robots would have synthetic human-like skin that are as close to appearance as humans as possible. And then mechanoids have a, a shape, general shape of a human. So it could have like, you know, the different appendages or it could have you know, something else for an arm, but if it looks like a human and it's metallic in structure um, and it's made of uh, non-pliable materials, then it is a mechanoid. And those are schemes within the six major types of robots that I've defined in the taxonomy. So the major types, if you don't mind, I'll kind of very briefly tell you, you know, what, those, what those types are. But um, the types include androids, uh, bionics, vessels, automata, megatech, and spectra. And the types are meant to cover all robots that exist today, as well as the robots that will exist in the future. Interesting. Interesting. Can you give us a breakdown? Is that too much? Are we going to push people to go and read it instead? Yeah, I mean, I would love for people to kind of read the treatise and kind of understand all the different, but, but I'll, I'll kind of break down how I've built the taxonomy. So I've mimicked Carl Linus's taxonomy that he built for, for biology, uh, you know, and his, his whole idea was to set up uh, you know, a, a, the, basically the tree of life, right? And, and classify biological creatures within that taxonomy. And so I've kind of mimicked that and I've created five different uh, classification levels. Uh, they basically cover realm and within realm, uh, I've, I've defined a realm as a grouping of entities that can evolve to a higher intelligence. And so biotica is one realm it covers natural biological intelligences. Robotica is a second realm that covers artificial constructed intelligences. And then Exotica is a third realm that covers exotic hybrid intelligences. Things like organoids that are lab created brains using frog cells uh, that have some living tissue, but are machines at, at their core, right? But you wouldn't necessarily be able to define them as a robot as per the definition of robot that I've given the treatise and they wouldn't be um, a natural biological intelligence. So those are the three realms. And then under realm, I've come up with type, which the six major types I've mentioned to you. And those types are based on design form. And then within each type, there are schemes. Uh, there's over 20 schemes uh, across the six different types. And mechanoid is one scheme. Synthoid is one scheme, as I told you, within Android. Um, you know, Auton is, is a scheme uh, that, that I give a name for uh, vehicular robots on land. So a Robomart would be within the Auton scheme, uh, within vessels, the type. And uh, Drone is for airborne robots uh, that are meant to f uh, uh, operate in the air. Uh, similarly, there's, there's other, you know, uh, different schemes within Aut Automata and Megatech and Spectra. Spectra is very interesting. I do want to, I, I, without going into too much detail, I want to talk about Spectra very briefly. Um, Spectra is a type that covers unconventional robotic entities. And what that means is, you know, um, MIT had this robot called the MorphBot, and it would change its shape. And it was like, it's called M-Blocks, and, and, and it's, it's within the scheme of, of MorphBot. But the M-Blocks basically can shape it, take, take different shapes and it can do it autonomously. So it can, you know, stand up and look like a, like a creature or it can become, you know, like a snake or, and, you know, I was struggling to figure out where to classify that robot. And I realized that, you know, um, Spectra is a good way to do so. There's a company in Japan that is called Gatebox. 
they develop a holographic robot. I call it a robot. It's not a artificial intelligence, pure software intelligence, because it has a physical embodiment. It has a casing, and the hologram actually has a projector that projects that hologram. And so you interface in your physical environment with that robot. And it's basically an anime character, and people can put it on their desk, and it's about this big. And, you know, it can talk to you, play games with you, and all that stuff. But it is a robot. And as it gets imbued with more and more intelligence, um, you know, the, the lines start to, start to, start to uh, you know, diverge. But it would be a robot. But it wouldn't fit in any other type. And so it's, it fits within Spectra. Why, why does that classify as a robot, though? I'm just curious, because if it's contained and a hologram, a holographic image, right? Obviously, I understand the AI side of it and everything like that and interactions, but yeah, it can't like physically do anything. It doesn't move, right? It can it take decisions and autonomously... Um, effect change in its physical environment. And okay. so if it can do that, it's a robot. So I'll tell you what my definition of a robot is in the treatise. Please. A robot is an artificial material construct designed to autonomously sense, decide, and operate within the physical world. So uh, by okay. that definition, a you know the gatebox holographic robot, it has a physical structure. It is able to effect change in its physical environment um, it classifies as a robot. And then you know, there's another scheme within, um, within Spectra that covers you know, um, uh, future potential robot types that are made of pure energy. I mean, we, we can't know every single yeah, type of robot that exists today. And so that's the idea that it serves as a catch-all for future robot types as well. Love that. Okay, cool. Thank you for explaining. Well, one of the other key themes uh, you've yeah. mentioned is... Um, within Systema Robotica is the order of evolution of robot kind. Can you elaborate on that concept as well? Sure, yeah. So, you know, the treatise goes, uh, after the taxonomy, there's a third section as well, Futura Robotica. And within Futura Robotica, um, there's, there's a few things that I, that I cover. The first is the role of robots. Like the impact of robots in society is gonna be unlike anything we've experienced, right, as a species. Um, there, there's going to be certain roles that robots serve across the spectrum, but I've created a matrix that essentially looks at where robots fall on this matrix based on, on one axis, their strength of relationship and emotional bond with humans, and on the other axis, their degree of intelligence and autonomy. And so, for example, if a robot is you know, very crude and impersonal, we have a very impersonal connection to it, it will be a robot as tool. It'll be a tool, which most robots are today. And as you move up that matrix, um, you know, as you go up in terms of intelligence and autonomy, if a robot is highly intelligent and highly, highly autonomous, but we still have a very poor emotional bond with it and it's very impersonal, that relationship, we will treat that robot as a slave. And then as you get to the other side, as you become more and more intimate with robots, people will... You know, marry the robots in the future, it's bound to happen. Robots will be advisors, guardians, companions. And so that's you know, one aspect of thinking about how robots will take roles in society and how we need to start thinking of this now. Again, it might be too soon, but I really feel like um, the sooner we start thinking about this future of non-human superintelligences and how we can, uh, uh, you know, how humanity can can. Uh, live and coexist, I think it's important to start doing that now. Yeah, definitely. I think once that starts happening, though, it's going to be like a hockey stick kind of growth as well. So getting ahead of that, thinking about it, preparing for it is, is very important. How do you see this evolution impacting various industries or specific industries? Yeah, so I think humanoids, like, uh, again, I'm using the term humanoids, androids, <laughs> Uh, well, I, the scheme are called mechanoids, which are humanoid uh, with, with non-pliable mechanical materials. Um, so I still use the term humanoid in the treatise. But, um, you know, androids, I think, are going to be a very interesting one. Um, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that, you know, we've built this world and we've built all our technology to, 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 to work in a world for humans. 
And so, you know, having Androids that, that can operate in this world is going to be extremely important. Um, and, and there's going to be a whole variety of tasks and a whole variety of things that they can do for humanity uh, that will improve our lives, make our lives better, and, you know, bring about this age of abundance. Um, and so, you know, uh, people ask me, what do you think? You know, how many robots are, are there going to be? Are we going to hit? I honestly believe we're going to see billions and billions of robots, like, you know, exceeding the human population. We're going to have close to 10 billion robots over the next maybe two decades. And uh, to get there is going to be a massive, uh, you know, climb for a lot of robotics companies and a lot of the entrepreneurs building in this space. Uh, but it's also an exciting time. Definitely. Yeah, I think the, the number that you put there is when you think about it, so realistic because every single industry and and also if you look at all the definitions that you've given there for robots and what a robot actually will be you're going to have to think about children are going to have robots you're going to have multiple in your home doing different tasks you might have a general purpose one they're going to be in workplace uh, restaurants logistics everything delivery retail yeah yeah it's uh when you take a step back and look at it like that it is very powerful to think about it Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, without getting uh, too, too self-promotional, obviously, I really believe in the future of, of having self-driving stores on every street corner. Yeah. Millions of stores across the world that can serve consumers in the most convenient way possible. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd love to have one close to me. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, so, look, how, how do you hope that Sistema Robotica is going to influence the future of robotics after it's released? Yeah, I think that's something like I, I've, I've really been talking to a lot of folks. Uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to assemble a great review panel of some of the top roboticists, you know, um, and, and other folks that have been giving, you know, their advice. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that keeps coming up is that, you know, th there's in, in any industry, right, that is poised to really explode, right? And I really believe robotics is, is, is the next industry that's going to explode. Like I said, it's going to bring about an age of abundance. Artificial intelligence combined with embodied robotics is going to really, really create a massive change in our world. And, you know, unless we start thinking about it, you know, there's a, there's a famous saying attributed to Confucius. Um, I don't know if it's an exact quote, but it's usually attributed to him that says, uh, you know, wisdom starts with, the proper name naming of things, right? So, uh, I think coming up with a naming structure, a taxonomy, a classification system for robots will really help roboticists and entrepreneurs and new founders trying to get into the space to better understand what it is they're building, what value are they adding, how are they serving humanity, what roles their robots are going to hold in society, uh, how they treat them, how they can make them more uh, valuable to humans. Um, and, and generally really build uh, a success out of whatever they're doing. That's perfect. Thank you. I know we touched on humanoids here. We keep skirting around them. But let me just ask you something directly. It might be controversial. I'm not sure. <laughs> so there's obviously the ongoing debate about the necessity of humanoid robots. And there's a lot of companies now working full steam ahead on that type of technology, general purpose, or whatever they want to apply them to. Do you believe humanoids are essential or are there more, or right now, do you think they're more of like a technological curiosity and nice R&D playing ground? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I love I love to see all the work that's being done, you know, with, with androids. Um, you know, there's some fantastic companies like um, 1X Robotics. I think I think that's, they're, they're building the Neo, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, you look at the, 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 the different androids that are being built, you know, the Aptronic robot is, is fantastic figure. You know, these robots, I really believe, like I said, will have a place in our society. They will be doing a lot of jobs that humans, uh, you know, do not like to do or there just aren't enough humans to do. Uh, but one thing that I will mention is that it's our natural instinct to anthropomorphize, you know, uh, robots. Yeah. But when you think about it, a robot chauffeur is not going to be an android sitting in a car, right? It's going to be an auto. It's going to be a car. 
you know, a janitor doesn't have to be a, a, a Android. It could be a servo, what I call a servo. And it could take different, different shapes. Um, again, a chef could be uh, an entire terminal, right? The entire kitchen could be a robot. And so it's, it's, it's exciting to see all the work that's being done in building Androids, but it's not the only form factor and the only design form. And again, in the, in the taxonomy, you know, there are 20 plus schematic classifications for what robots can be and what kind of design form they can have. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, cool. That makes sense. It's always something that I like asking because people, it seems to be pretty polarizing, <laughs> as I'm sure you're aware of, but having everyone's input is, is uh, valuable. And yeah, you know, something that you mentioned there about, you know, for example, the chef, obviously the chauffeur, we can all see that now with, with, you know, you go to San Francisco or wherever, and you can get your Waymo to come pick you up and stuff like that. That's a robot you wouldn't expect a person to go in and drive your car. Um, I have heard the argument for the other way as well, though, that that's probably the best and quickest way to having a self-driving car. And then the chauffeur can get out and help you in other areas. But <clears throat> that's a whole other debate. The have kitchen. Also, oh, sorry to interrupt, but have you seen Total sorry. Recall, the original? Yes. Yeah. In that they had a robot driving a car. And I always found that incredibly funny. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. I was uh, one of my guests recently... Regis, he worked on a uh, uh, autonomous motorbike, but it was a it was basically like a, an Android on a motorbike driving it, which obviously is his own challenge. But yeah, it's pretty cool. We linked the video in the show notes, so that was fun. Um, but you mentioned the the chef, and I hadn't actually thought about. Obviously, I do a lot in food tech. Spoke to a lot of people in there as well, but a fully functioning kitchen, like large kitchen restaurant style completely reimagined from the ground up as a robot kitchen right that sounds really cool instead of just one doing like obviously first things first right you do fries you can do a burger you can do like simple things or have a kiosk and stuff like that but a full commercial kitchen reimagined as a chef and like a brand name chef that's a pretty cool concept to think about Absolutely, yeah. And there are companies that are working in that space already, like Miso Robotics and a few others. Um, you know, and their their robots are quite quite large. I mean, they're they're not what you would traditionally think. Some of them do, you know, just a, a, a an articulator, just an arm. The robot is basically you know fixed to different appliances. But um, and then some just do like I, I remember a friend of mine. They sold their company. They were they were uh, I was advising them for a while. They were doing uh, salad prep. Um, so their robot basically was a bunch of um, rotating disks and bowls, and um, and it was running autonomously. So you know it meets the definition of a robot. Um, but you know I, I really don't see why it has to be a a Android standing in a kitchen. You know, but, but the but again the idea is that we've built so many things to fit in a human centric world. Things like a pan, things like the oven, like you know you. You do see the value in having, uh, you know, uh, robots with humanoid shape and form and design form that can start do those tasks. So I really do believe there is a place for androids, but it's not just the only. I mean, I really believe that robots are going to take multiple shapes and, and, and design. Yeah. I think if you're bringing the robot into your environment, then there's some value in that, right? If you have a general purpose android humanoid whatever you want to call it into your own home to help you with those tasks definitely but if you're building from scratch a fully autonomous whatever it is restaurant or facility rethinking all of it is is where we see that right now in in the warehousing and logistics space or retail yeah absolutely i mean there's one there's one type called megatech in the in the taxonomy that uh, as of today, there's zero robots that fit within this type. Um, things that are over 1 million um, cubic uh, uh, meters in size. And so um, massive, massive megastructures, robot megastructures, like spaceships that fit that size, um, or even you know, planetoids, robots that are in the shape of an entire planet. So um, there's, there's going to be, in the far future, a lot of different... Uh, uh, robots that are built that don't fit a certain design aesthetic that we think of 
when we think of robot today. Um, but but yeah, like I said, I, I do believe there's going to be billions of of androids uh, that exist alongside us in the world. Amazing. What what do you see as the next big thing in robotics, and how does Systema Robotica prepare the industry for it? I think. Um, I mean, obviously, we can talk a lot about industrial use cases and, and you know, again, being self-fortunate, I can talk about self-driving stores all day long. Um, but, you know, that's obviously, you know, a vision we've had for now seven years. And uh, going back to, to the time we had the original idea, you know, we've been thinking about this for a very long time. I really believe that that is the future. But specifically to your point, I think one aspect of the treatise that I think is critical for us to address is the final uh, part of the treatise it addresses concept of sentience. And it's a very challenging term to, to define. Um, some people will equate sentience to having feelings or emotions or the ability to, to suffer, feel pain. Um, you know, they look at animals as being sentient. Some people equate sentience to consciousness. But the problem with that is that there's no shared understanding of what consciousness actually is. And there's a lot of, you know, quite famous philosophers that have, have talked about how we cannot subjectively experience other entities' conscious lived experience. Uh, but still, we need, we need a way to judge sentience, right? Uh, as robots and artificial intelligences become super intelligent, and as you were talking about, they keep growing on this exponential growth path, um, we need to start thinking about how we can judge sentience and how that will impact us. And so I've defined what I call the sentience equation and it has four attributes that make up sentience. And then I've proposed a novel test for sentience. Can you share that? Or is this going to be another plug? Definitely read the, <laughs> the treatise. I, I think it, it, it's important to read the whole treatise to understand how I've classified robots, how I talk about instance, which is the robot's mind um, and its lived experience, like the robot instance and then once you kind of understand all that, uh, it'll, it'll become a lot clearer when you think about the sentience equation and the specific test for, for, for testing sentience within Robotica. Makes sense. Okay, awesome. And tying back to your current main focus, Robomart, what's, uh, what do you envision the future playing uh, or what do you envision the future for Robomart and how do you see it fitting into this future of uh, robotics innovation that's coming? Yeah, so I mean, we are right now focused on the deployments with Mars here on the East Coast, um, but we are really excited about expanding. You know, we've, we've signed a few other customers and we want to start expanding aggressively. Um, the, the, you know, we're, we're basically following the right healing playbook, right? And, and the way that right healing was able to, to become top of mind and really scale up aggressively I believe that's the same playbook that we have to follow to get store healing in self-driving stores in pretty much every major city. You know, it's, it's going to take time, but at the same time, we've already started. We already have customers. We've tested this with consumers. We had 90% repeat buyers when we did our pilots in West Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Consumer uses it one time and they're hooked, right? The convenience is unparalleled. And so... Um, you know, it's, it's now on us to really uh, find the right customers who can help us scale this up and take this nationwide. Look, Ali, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate you sharing all of this with us and giving us the insight into the, your treatise and then also Robomar. I'm very excited about that and hopefully that expands soon. Um, before we go, is there any advice that you can give for young engineers, scientists and aspiring founders in the robotic space? Absolutely. Yeah. I think the biggest impact they can do is to start a company in the space. You know, it's, it's not easy. It's one of the hardest, um, you know, things you can do is start a robotics company. But at the same time, I feel like we are now at the cusp of an age of abundance and an explosion in, 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 in robotics companies. And so it's the right time to get into it. It's, it's almost like the dot com era in the late nineties. And so I would really implore founders and, and engineers and students and other people that are looking to get into this space to do so right now. Love that. Yeah. And uh, I'll piggyback off that. Investors, put more money in. <laughs> VCs, whoever it is, get more involved because I think that 
it's it's so expensive to create hardware and great companies and the more dollars that flow into the space the more innovation the more products <clears throat> the faster we can get this going uh where can uh i say where can what can we keep a lookout for from you uh, and from Robomart in the coming future? Yeah, I mean, right now, I think the big one is the treatise, right? So it will be published in a few different journals as well as on uh, the website as an open uh, open access public good. And the website is systemarobotica.com. And then on Robomart, right now, we're, we're really focused on the deployment with Mars and we're really excited to hopefully scale up nationally. And you can go to robomart.ai to, to learn more. Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing that. We will link both of those in the show notes so everyone will have access. By the time this comes out, it should be released as well, published. So exciting. I'm looking forward to reading it myself. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you, Greg. It was a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.